Amen. want to invite you to grab your Bibles with me and turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We will continue our journey through the Gospel of Mark uh, this morning by looking at um, verses 13 to 16. So I'm going to read uh, the text together. We'll have it on the screen for you as well. But we'll uh, read the text together. And then we're going to pray and ask for God's help. And then we are going to get to work. So verse 13, Mark 10. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. And Father, we do need your help to understand your word, God. To to grasp the significance of of these few short verses, God, that, that in these scriptures we see, in in these verses we see um, what is required in order to enter the kingdom. And Father, there is no more important thing than we could ever do than to leave the kingdom of darkness and come over into the kingdom of light. God, we thank you that the king has come. We thank you that he alone grants entrance to his kingdom. And God, we ask that He would do that work of sovereign grace in this room today for your glory. In your name. Amen. So you have to remember where we've been. Jesus uh, just came out of a very popular teaching on divorce. He's, uh, he's teaching the crowds as he, as he often did. And he has uh, the Pharisees, the religious rulers, come in and they try to test him to try to trap him. And they try to do that by saying, Jesus, explain divorce to us. And they're trying to get Jesus to, um, to disagree with, with the law, to disagree with the, 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 the thrust of the teaching of that day, and to get himself into hot water. And, and he uh, answers um, the question masterfully by, by going back to the scriptures and going back to God's original design in marriage. And, and after he's done with that, he leaves kind of the public teaching of the crowds. And, and in verse 10, he, he went to a house. And then in the house, the disciples ask him some follow-up questions with regard to divorce. And that's all last week. You can go listen to it. So, so now it, it seems as though he's still in that house. And, and while he's there, uh, it would seem taking a break, taking a rest, um, people here, namely parents, families here, that he's in the house. And so, verse 13, they were bringing children to him that he might touch them. Now, you have to understand uh, the first century um, view of children. They, 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 they were not held in the same value um, in, 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 in right value at this time. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Um, there are accounts of, of uh, fathers hearing that they were having, uh, or, or having, uh, that he, fathers hearing that their daughter had a, 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 or that their wife had a daughter rather than a son, and the father had the authority to have the daughter uh, aborted, basically because she couldn't further the family name, and so get, get her out of here. There are accounts of, of, um, parents being able to get rid of their children at any, at any time they wanted to. They could put them outside of their house next to where like they would put out their trash and the child could sit there and if somebody else wanted the child they could take them. Otherwise the child would just die and, and people would take these children and use them for, um, for prostitutes or for uh, um, gladiators or for slaves. And so, so that was the view of, of children in the first century. And, and what you see here, and you, you need to not miss this, because if you're not careful, perhaps you might fail to realize that, 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 that the, uh, uh, an exalted view of children, that seeing the value of children, 
Similar to seeing the value of women. Because women and children in this society were, were not valued as they ought to have been. The, the, if you trace the origins of valuing women and valuing children, you're going to trace them back to uh, Jesus Christ. And the way in which he places value and, and emphasis on women, on children, on the overlooked in society. And so... So that's the first century view of children. That they had a wrong view and Jesus means to write that. Now, that does not mean that we have a right view. Because I actually think that the pendulum has swung so far now to the other side where, where rather than, than God-centered homes, I think in many instances you have children-centered homes where children run the show and children call the shots. And that's a problem on the other extreme. And Jesus means to, to bring our understanding of, of children Children, and that's not the main point of the text, but you're going to see him as he does that here, to bring our understanding of children into, into a proper context. And so you have to understand first century, uh, first century view of, of children. And, and so, so you have these parents. That, that's the they of verse 13. They were bringing children to him that he might touch them. These are Jewish parents bringing their children to, to Jesus, who's a, who's a rabbi, who's a teacher, with a pretty significant following, honestly. And they hear he's in the house, and so they just kind of spontaneously line up, and they're bringing their kids to Jesus in order that he would touch them or, or give them a blessing. This was not unheard of with regard to rabbis, but... but um, so, so you can kind of see, like, get in your mind this picture of here's Jesus in this house, and there's a line of, of parents with their crazy kids running all over the place, out the door, and, and that's, that's kind of the, the picture that you, would, that you would have. And at the end of verse 13, the disciples rebuked them, that is, rebuked the parents. The disciples come to the parents and essentially say, Jesus is a big deal. He has way more important things to do than, than put his hands on top of your snot-nosed kids. Get out of here. Take your kids with you. You could say that the disciples had adopted society's view of children rather than the Messiah's view of children. And we are always in danger, church. Always in danger, regardless of proximity to Jesus, that perhaps you are viewing something or someone through society's lenses, which are always going to be wrong to the extent that they do not bow the knee to the, the view that Christ would give us. And so the disciples, following Jesus, are rebuking these parents, get your kids out of here, they're unimportant. Well, Jesus isn't having it. Verse 14, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. This is um, a very, very strong word, indignant. It would mean like a vented anger. In other words, Jesus, um, his anger isn't just kept inside of him. R rather, his, his anger is vented. He, he's angry and he makes his anger known to the disciples by saying, let the children come to me. Let, let the children come to me. So, so disciples, you, your mind is not dialed into the kingdom right now. You think these children are unimportant. This makes Jesus angry at his disciples. He vents that anger by saying, and the disciples know, let the children come to me. And, and I think we need to at least identify two things here going on with Jesus for, for why he would say, let the children come to me. Number one, he says that because he values children. He values them. Now, now the, the value that Jesus places on children can, can be traced all the way back to the creation account in Genesis. Where, where God says in the Trinity, let us, that's the Trinity, make man in our own image. And when you see that, you understand that, that children have intrinsic value to God because children are made in his image. That women have intrinsic value to God because they're made in his image. That men have intrinsic value to God because they're made in his image. With that, the, if, if just that was understood, the almost unspeakable horrors of abortion and racism and all of the other terrible atrocities of which I'm not sure that any compared to abortion in the history of this world, God help our country, 
If, if, if we understood the value that Jesus places on children, places on women, places on men, regardless of skin color, regardless of socioeconomic status, simply because they're made in his image. And if that's not understood, then the horrors of the millions, I can't even talk about it without crying, the millions of babies murdered in this country, the, the, the horrible, um, the, the Holocaust, all of those terrible things, th that's what happens when you start seeing value externally on somebody rather than internally as children made in the image of God. Because if you don't have intrinsic value given by a creator, then that means you get determined value based on skin color, and what they can do for you. Jesus isn't having it. Let the children come to me. I value them. They're made in my image. Second, Jesus doesn't only value children, but he loves them. Now, you can value something without loving it. But Jesus here has a tenderness and a, a, a fondness for these children. He loves them. You, you see this um, in verse 16 as he takes these children in his arms and he blesses them and he lays his hands on them. He loves these children. And I think the implication for us to ponder, church, is, is as Jesus values these children and he loves these children, we must also value and love children. Jesus says, it's very interesting, he says, let the children come to me. Let them come to me. Now, here's a question. And, and it may, it, we, we may miss it if we aren't thinking about it. Let the children come to me. How did the children get there? I'm just asking. How did the children get there? Verse 13, right. They were bringing children. Do you know why the children had to be brought? Because they're too small to get there. You know, my three-year-old asked me for the keys we're putting them on a higher shelf than they originally were. We're not giving him the keys. The children can't get to Jesus themselves, but Jesus says, let the children come. Do you know what the implication is? The implication is, parents, get your children over here and bring them to me. That's the implication. Children, bring your parents to me. Children, if you, or um, I don't know if I said that backwards, but you know what I mean. But parents, if you love your children and value your children, you bring them to me. That's what Jesus is saying. If you love children and value children, you bring them to me. This is why I'm so thankful as I was reflecting this week on this text. I'm so thankful for, for people like Miss Shirley who lead our children's ministry here. And, and the volunteers who serve in this. And, and those who go up into the nursery to hang out with, with your kids. Who are a bit of a handful if we're being honest. And there's 40 of them up there. And, and they're up there loving and serving and, and wanting to bring your children to Jesus. And I praise God for the emphasis of church churches on discipling and evangelizing children. But I also have perhaps a word of caution here for us. And the word of caution goes something like this. My view and the elders' view of children's ministry at Redemption Hill is in a supplemental role. So a supplemental role to the part that you as parents are playing in bringing your children to Jesus. In other words, mom and dad shoulder the load on that and you bring those kids occasionally here on Sunday morning and we want to help you in that. That's very different than what I suspect is the understanding of so many parents today, which is, which is um, especially fathers today, which is, well, that's not really my thing, so I'll, I'll, I'll bring my kids in, let the professionals deal with them, and then they'll kind of get their understanding there. No. No, we praise God for good children's ministries. I, I was even reflecting um, earlier this week about being a little guy myself and, um, you know, rocking my clip-on uh, tie to church because if you didn't have a tie on, even if you were four, they'd kick you out. That was the church we were going to. And so had your little clip-on tie, you're getting shoved into some, you know, closet that is actually your Sunday school room, but it was a closet when it wasn't being. And, and, and here's a felt board and here's, here's some some faithful woman of God, I don't even remember her name, putting up picture, uh, putting up stuff on the felt board and it's fallen off and she's teaching about Abraham, teaching about the Exodus, teaching about these things. 
No, nobody's celebrating her. I, I, didn't have, I, I didn't even know where I was, let alone have the good sense to thank her for the thankless job of discipling me. Yet, yet we have them, they're in this church, they're in this building right now doing, doing that very thing, that thankless job. But they're doing it not, dad, mom, as a replacement so that you don't have to do it, but rather to come alongside of you and partner with you in that good work of loving and valuing your children and bringing them to Jesus. Now let me make an observation. It's one of the more painful observations I've made in the years of ministry and it's this. Where homes are Bible-saturated homes, prayer-saturated homes, gospel-saturated homes, which I pray that they are, but oftentimes where and when I see that, this observation won't hold for all of us, but some of us need to hear it. When and where I see that, it is often mom who is doing the praying, Mom, who was doing the, 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 the memorizing of Scripture and the teaching these children the Bible. It's mom who's bringing these, children, these kids to church. It's mom doing the discipline. It's mom doing all of that. And I have remarked on a number of occasions, dads, where are you? Where are you? Where are you in this process? We have to reclaim a version of fatherhood that does not only include dad going to work. And dad, listen, you should go to work. You should go work your tail off to provide for your family. But then you need to come home and do the real work of shepherding and leading spiritually in your home. Praise God for mothers who are praying mothers. But where are the fathers? I just asked myself that. Where are the fathers? Where are the fathers who will come home, work hard, shepherd those kids? Where are the fathers who will take an interest in their sons more than just teach them how to hunt or fish or throw a football? Where are the fathers who are teaching their young men by example how to read their Bible, how to pray, how to understand the gospel? Where are the fathers whose Bibles are falling apart? Without that, without those men leading in those ways, we will, we will never value and love our children and bring them to Jesus as we ought to. I praise God for families and homes that are underpinned by praying mothers, but in that there is great sorrow as I look around and see absent fathers. Now dad, listen to me. I did not come in here to punch you in the mouth, although you may feel like it. What, what, I've, what, what I want to do here is I want to point out this simple truth. If you look at your life and you are absent from, from the spiritual development of your children, if you have the want to, do you know what I mean by that? If you have the willpower, if you have the, the I, want, I want to get involved in that, we can equip you. The equipping is not difficult. The equipping in this thing is not hard. It's, it's the fathers that, 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 that just ha- are absent of the want to. That are absent of the, I'll be damned before I sit back and let my kids just wander on through and hope they figure it out. You give me a dad that has the want to, we, we can make this thing work. That part is not difficult. And so dad, you may, maybe got punched, but we want to help you in this, and we can help you in this. So Jesus loves and values children. He wants us to bring our children to him. And then he makes a very, very interesting statement. He says, to such, so let the children come to me, don't hinder them, for, because to such belongs the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus, in the next verse, is about to demonstrate to us, by way of example of a little child, by way of example, Jesus is going to show us how it is that we enter the kingdom. Now, it could be, and some commentators take that text to only mean that Jesus is putting a little kid on his lap and demonstrating by holding that little kid and giving the disciples and us, by extension, an example of how to get into the kingdom. Where there are other Uh, other commentators who look at that text and go, well, Jesus says that, that the kingdom belongs to these children. 
So, so which is it? Is Jesus saying that these little children, these infants as Luke calls them, these, these little babies and toddlers, that, is he saying that they're actually a part of his kingdom? Or is he saying, well, they're an example of how you as grown adults need to get into the kingdom? My answer is he's doing both. And I'll take the first one first. And if that doesn't make sense to you, I'm going to explain it right now. Jesus says, in reference to these little children, he says that they belong to the kingdom. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. So, so again, here's this line full of people. There's parents, there's little kids ripping around all over the place. And Jesus says, don't hinder them, disciples. Let them come to me. I love them. I value them. Those little children belong to the kingdom of God. Now, there's been a long debate, if you're not aware, um, there's been a long debate throughout church history of what happens to children when they die. I don't think there should be a debate. I think it's clear, for to such belong the kingdom of God. I think that when a, when a baby dies, when a, when a toddler dies, when, by extension, when someone who, who does not have the capacities to, to trust Christ for salvation die, I, I, I think they go to heaven. And I say that, the reason there's the debate is because there's not a verse in the Bible that says when a baby dies, they'll go to heaven. But you take the, the, the breadth of the scriptures, you take verses in, in, in texts like this one, and I think it's difficult to conclude anything other than those children belong to the kingdom of God. And they belong to the kingdom of God because God has supplied grace for them while, while they are small and, and unable to accept or reject a Messiah, that God has provided grace for them, that if they die in that condition of being that small and that unable, this could be in the womb or outside of the womb, if they die in that condition, they belong to the kingdom of God. So I think that's clear. But then when Jesus continues in verse 15, he says, Truly I say to you. So here's, here's, the, here's the example part of this. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child won't enter it. Okay. So get the picture again, right? Jesus in a house, lying out the back. He's just kind of breathed some fire on the disciples. They kind of scatter because they're not sure what to do. The parents start to come back because the disciples were kicking them out. The parents start to kind of trickle back in. And, and that's the scene, right? Dark room, I mean, kind of dusty, kind of crazy. And Jesus, as you can see in verse 16, um, he, took, he took one of those children, them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. So Jesus has got these kids really close to him, these little toddler, snot-nosed, little dirty, scrubby, little ratty, someone else's kids. We don't even, this kid's not even with his family. He just moved to the front of the line. And so, so that's the picture. And Jesus says, they belong to the kingdom, and if you don't come like them, you won't, you, won't, you won't belong to the kingdom at all. Whoever does not receive the kingdom like a child shall not enter it. Now, this right here is where I suspect many, many sermons have gone off the rails. Do you know why? Because it is very, very easy to, to at this point, evaluate a little kid, make some observations that aren't really true, tell some funny stories and have the whole congregation giggle and we all leave feeling good. I, I actually don't think, I mean, everybody loves stories about kids, but that's, that's not where the sermon needs to go because I don't think that Jesus, for example, is holding a three-year-old and going, you see how humble this kid is? You gotta be humble like this kid. If you're humble like this kid, you get into the kingdom. Problem is that kid's not humble, which is why Jesus never said those words. Some preacher somewhere said those words, but that preacher apparently didn't have kids because you've never met a humble three-year-old because they don't exist. So, so here, Jesus is not looking at the, at, the, um, at the stat line of a four-year-old and being like, he's humble, he's trusting, he's all, all of those bad sermon outlines that I've, that I've heard and read and seen. That, that's not what he's doing. Jesus here is not commending to the disciples that they find um, the, the humility of a child and then come into the kingdom. That's not what he's saying. I think what he's saying instead is, is he's, not, 
he's not looking at what these children have and saying because of what they have, they're in the kingdom. Instead, he's looking at what they don't have. And it's because of what they don't have that they're in the kingdom. Do you know what children don't have? Do you know what, do you know what they're lacking? These kids, they, they literally, they don't have anything. No credentials. No reputation of, of, of righteousness to bring forth. No, no sphere of influence. None of that. They don't have anything. And it is precisely because a three-year-old doesn't have anything that he can be commended to the kingdom. You say, on what basis, if he doesn't have anything, on what basis is he commended to the kingdom? The answer is grace. Grace. This is a king who is sitting in a room with a four-year-old on his lap, and he is a gracious king who says, when you come to me, you come like a child. The child doesn't know he's coming that way. He doesn't know anything. The child is coming with nothing, and it is out of the child's lack that Jesus makes up for that lack in his grace. And the result of that is, is that that child is in the kingdom because they aren't trying to contribute to getting there. And Jesus is commending that to all of us by extension. And you better be clear to understand this. Jesus is speaking into a context that is not unlike ours at all an incredibly religious context. Do you know what religion essentially is? It's this. Grab a bunch of stuff, bring it to Jesus, and hope he will accept you based on the stuff in your hands. Grab your Bible reading, grab your baptism, grab your confession, grab your Eucharist, grab your catechism, grab your church attendance, grab your I'm a good person, whatever that even means. Grab that, just grab all that stuff, Bring that into the room with Jesus, lay it on a table, and kind of gauge his response. If he looks like he's pleased, then you're probably getting in. But if he kind of tips his head to the side to think, you better run back out of there and find something else and bring that in. That's essentially first century Judaism in a nutshell. And that is also essentially 21st century religion in a nutshell, even the religion of irreligion. I'm a good person, I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other thing. And based off of that, I hope that that's enough to get the king to accept me. And Jesus would say, and I will say, to hell with that, because that's where it belongs and that's where it came from. We are not recipients of the kingdom because we bring something. We we come into the kingdom only when we come with empty hands. The problem with you holding on to morality so tight is that there's no room in, in your grip for anything other than your morality, which means you can't actually cling to Christ because you're too busy holding on to your own jacked up righteousness. This is where a three-year-old is so helpful because a three-year-old's not coming in carrying anything because a three-year-old doesn't have anything to carry. And if you miss this, And if you buy into the low-boil religious um, uh, sentences that are thrown our way in all sorts of ways, if you miss this, then you will miss the king and his kingdom. There's at least one more question we ought to ask ourselves. If a baby who dies in infancy or who dies at a young age goes to heaven, but not because they're sinless, because the Bible's very clear that we are born sinners. So they, don't go, they go to heaven, but they don't go to heaven because they're sinless. And, and, and if the invitation of the gospel is leave every hope that you could possibly cling to for any acceptance... Cast all hope aside of good works or any of that tipping the scales to, 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 to make God favor you. If the invitation of the gospel is essentially what the hymn writer captured so beautifully, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. If that is the invitation of the gospel, then we have to ask ourselves, on what basis then is that baby who dies, who has a sinful heart, on what basis is that baby led into the kingdom? 
On what basis is the 35 or the 40 year old who comes to faith in Jesus today while I'm preaching because he has let go of his righteousness, on what basis is that, is that 40 year old brought into the kingdom? You, you, listen to me, you won't get into the kingdom apart from perfect righteousness. The Bible's very clear on that. And so the answer goes something like this. Someone has come. Unlike you, his righteousness was perfect. Unlike you, he always did the will of his father. Unlike you, he never disobeyed anything his father had asked him to do. Unlike you, he loved the Lord his God with all of his heart, his soul, his mind, and his strength for every moment of his life. And he loved his neighbor as himself, even to the point of death on a cross. Unlike you, every thought he ever had was perfect, perfectly centered on the will of the Father. And what he has chosen to do for the baby who dies in infancy and for the 50-year-old who would come to him by faith today, what he has elected to do in his sovereign grace is invite you into the room and give you a share of his righteousness based solely off of your confession that you don't have any. He sees two empty, grubby little hands come in the room and he fills up those hands with righteousness. He robes himself, um, he, he, he takes his righteousness and he wraps it as a robe around that one who would come and confess, I don't have any righteousness. This is what the reformers referred to as an alien righteousness. It has come from outside of me. And Jesus freely gives his perfect righteousness to any and all who would come. Will you say, okay, so I put on a, I actually just had this question on Friday, so I put on a robe of righteousness that kind of covers over me, but it makes it sound like what you're saying is, is that I just wear a coat of righteousness while underneath I got all this grimy sin still going on. If you think that, you have not fully understood what happened on the cross. The reason he died is because someone had to pay the penalty of your sin. The, the, the reason he died in the horrible way that he did is because the wrath over your sin had to be poured out on someone. The reason he's treated the way that he was treated by the Father and it was right is because he became sin. And if God is just, he must pour out wrath on sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that what? So that we could become his righteousness. This is what Martin Luther called the great exchange. This is what Pastor David referred to this morning. Jesus Christ takes your sin off of you and the sin of, of every baby that, never, uh, that, that doesn't make it and the sin of, of, of all who would trust in him. He takes that sin off, places it on himself, is punished by God for that, and then in exchange for that, he then gives you his righteousness. That, that, well, that's almost too good to be true. If you try to come in the room with him, and you've got some, some righteousness of your own, all it means is, is you have not yet understood the gospel. All it means is, is you don't understand the depth of your sin. All it means is, is that you are going to miss the kingdom of light and end up in the kingdom of darkness for all of eternity. You need to repent. I've said this before. M many of us in this room, it is our righteousness, quote unquote, that is keeping us from the kingdom. It is that we've got too much stuff in our hands and we can't open them up like a four-year-old and come in, in helpless dependence to a king who would gladly and freely save by grace. Father, would you do that work in us, in this room, for your glory? God, would, would you 
right now by your spirit, would you be convicting, God, and changing? God, would you, would you love us enough in this room right now to break our hands of, of this counterfeit righteousness that we've been trying to hold on to? God, either holding on to it, because God help us, that's what we were taught growing up, or, or maybe just holding on to it because we know that unrighteous people can't enter the presence of a holy God. And God, would you lift our faces to see, to ask the question with the psalmist, who is this king of glory? Who is this king who would come down into this world and live perfectly, and die horribly, and rise victoriously in our place. Who is this king? Who is this king who would sit in this dusty room and grab in a hold of infants, and two-year-olds, and three-year-olds, and, and God loving them so perfectly, and by extension loving us? Who is this king who accepts people who cannot in any way contribute to his kingdom? Who is this king? Father, might we find, might some of us in this room be finding ourselves answering that question properly for the very first time that it is none other than your son, Jesus. And God, might we find ourselves answering that properly and for the very first time in our lives having that name not just be some other name, but that name be the name of our Savior in whom we have trusted. God, would you do that work for your glory? It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.